Right now on Morning News Now, deadline day. Former President Donald Trump facing a nearly half a billion dollar bond due today. And if he can't pay up, some of his New York properties could be seized. And that's not the only major legal problem for the presumptive Republican nominee for president. We'll tell you what a judge is expected to announce today in the New York hush money case. Plus, Moscow morning. Russian leader Vladimir Putin is vowing revenge after an apparent terror attack by the group ISIS. K left more than 130 people dead. The new insight from the survivors and the fears the attack could lead to even more bloodshed in Ukraine. Also this morning, the United Nations Secretary General says it's time to flood Gaza with aid, calling the starvation inside the enclave a moral outrage. But aid trucks are still parked outside the Rafah crossing. We've got the latest as another ceasefire resolution heads for a vote. And he's been named one of the top comedians to watch. But his journey has been anything but traditional. I'll tell you how Modi flipped the script and went from working in finance to comedy. A few laughs on this Monday morning. I know, here. we love it. Great to have one <laughs> kicking off us a week. Exactly. Having a flip in the script. It's so great. Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We begin a new week here in New York where former President Trump is facing a deadline today to pay a more than $450 million bond in his civil fraud case in order to stop his assets from being targeted. Mr. Trump has said that he is challenging the judgment in the case and will take it to the Supreme Court if necessary. Those penalties against Mr. Trump and his company stem from a lawsuit brought by New York Attorney General Letitia James. After a months-long trial last month, a judge ordered Trump to pay more than $354 million in damages, a number that increased because of interest. Also scheduled for today, a hearing to set a trial start date in the criminal hush money case against the former president. Mr. Trump is expected to appear in court for that hearing, which is slated to start at 10 a.m. Eastern time. His motorcade arrived at Trump Tower overnight. The trial was originally actually supposed to get underway today, but the judge delayed the start date. By 30 days. Now, Trump is accused of falsifying business records in connection to $130,000 in alleged hush money payments that his former lawyer, Michael Cohen, made to adult film actress Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Trump pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. Breaking it all down for us, we're joined by NBC News national correspondent Yasmin Vesugian in Lower Manhattan and NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos is here with us in studio. So, Yasmin, lots of New York-centered legal news. Let's start with you. That deadline the former president is facing today over paying the money owed in his civil fraud case. He says he has the money. That appears to contradict his lawyers last week. So where do things stand? What could we start seeing today? A, a big day, guys, um, this morning down here at 100 Center Street, where the former president uh, will be later on today when the trial begins around 10 a.m. I'm not sure if the news today is the press lineup and or what's going to be happening inside that courtroom. But let's talk first about um, the deadline when it comes to the $464 million in which the former president um, owes right now um, for that appeals bond. He says, as you said, um, has he has the money. That was Thursday night in which he put out two subsequent tweets in, in, in that he said he had $500 million and then said he had a lot of cash as well. His attorneys, though, saying he does not, in fact, have um, the money. The thing is, for the former president, True Social, Trump Media, is going to begin trading today publicly, Forbes estimating um, hit, that valuation could bring his... Um, his money up $3 billion. So think about that. He could use his, for instance, shares in True Social and Trump Media as collateral if he wants to gain that $500 million in loans from either a wealthy donor and or a bank. He's going to have to seek permission from his board, though, to use those shares as collateral. But let me tell you who's on that board, one of which is his son, Donald Trump Jr., along with three former members of the Trump administration. So the likelihood that the board will say, yeah, go ahead and do that is fairly high. So we're going to be watching today because Tish James has already said that she would move to see some of his properties. Whether or not he comes up with that money today is really in question. But again, True Social hitting the market, trading publicly. Um, we'll mm -hmm. wait and see. 
Uh, Danny, we know the appeal here will make its way through state court. So what would the Supreme Court's options be if this ultimately did land there? They have no options because if you're talking about the United States Supreme Court, there's really no way the Supreme Court could even take this case mm -hmm. on. There really isn't a jurisdictional hook. You can't appeal every case in every court up to the Supreme Court. You have to have a federal reason. Most often, that reason is based in the Constitution. If you're a criminal uh, defendant, for example, it's that your search and seizure rights have been violated, something along those lines. But you don't automatically have a right to go to the federal United States Supreme Court. In all likelihood, this is a case that involves purely state issues, and the most you can appeal it to is from the New York. Now, this is where it gets confusing. In the state of New York, the lowest trial court's actually called the Supreme Court. From there, you can go to the appellate division, and then from there, you can go to what's called the Court of Appeals. That is effectively New York's Supreme Court in that it's the highest court of the land. Will it go to the Court of Appeals? Likely. I think the Court of Appeals would take it up, even if the issues aren't novel, because it's Trump and mm. things change when it's Trump. But in all likelihood, that's as far as it will go. It will not make it to the United States Supreme Court. Mm. All right, Yasmin, let's talk about the hush money case. Manhattan District Attorney Alvin yeah. Bragg did not oppose the Trump legal team's request for that 30-day delay. Now we know Trump, he wants us to postpone 90 days. Bragg doesn't want it to go that long. What can we expect today? He, he wants this thing to go out the window altogether. That, that's not going to happen. Um, today was supposed to be the, the, the start of the trial day, jury selection. Um, but because of that subsequent delay, likely today we're going to learn two things. First and foremost is the actual trial date. We'll get a trial date set today. The second is an explanation over why 170,000 documents were handed over to Trump's attorneys so late in the game, just in the last couple of weeks, by the way. So Morshawn wants really an explanation as to why that took place to then subsequently decide when this trial is going to uh, begin. And you walked folks through the delays and the motions to delay from Trump's um, attorneys. I think the other thing is um, Bragg and his attorneys are kind of making the argument that despite the fact that they handed over 170,000 um, documents to Trump's attorneys, really only 300 pages of those documents pertain to this actual case in which they should be able to read through those, go over those in the next subsequent couple of weeks to be able to start a trial within the next 20 days or so. So those are the two things we're going to be looking for. The arguments made by uh, D.A. Bragg's office as to why this happened, this delay happened, and then the trial date, guys. Danny, let's talk about some details about what we could see, you know, when this does actually get underway. So the judge presiding over the case, he had denied the former president's bid to try to prevent both Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen from taking the stand. Uh, but they, there are some restrictions here, especially when it comes to Daniels' testimony. How's that going to impact things? This is a rare glimpse into what are called motions in limine. These are motions that attorneys like me file in advance of a trial to pare down the issues. And ordinarily, you ask high and hope to get somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. I don't know that Trump's attorneys really thought there was a chance that they'd be able to preclude uh, Stormy Daniels or Michael Cohen, especially Michael Cohen. Mm. He is the star witness, in my view, of this Manhattan DA's case. So in all likelihood, they weren't going to preclude him completely from appearing. But what you can do instead is ask the judge to consider different areas of testimony that should not be entered into. And normally those have to do with either relevance or maybe they're too prejudicial or maybe they're redundant. So uh, there are some victories here for the Trump team. And you can win a lot of a criminal case in the motions in limine process, because if the judge excludes critical information from the case, then that, that jury is never going to hear that bad stuff. Mm. All right. Danny, Yasmin, thank you both for kicking us off this hour. We appreciate it. Well, this morning, four suspects are in custody and charged in connection with Friday's deadly terror attack on a concert hall in Moscow. At least 137 people are dead. Yesterday, Russia honored those who were killed with a day of mourning. NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley has more. Moscow mourned. A rare silence over this city is after Russia endured its deadliest terror attack in 20 years. That's why we're with the country. We're together, said this mourner. The death toll rose again to 137, according to Russia's government, including three children. As emergency workers continued searching for more dead under the rubble of this vast concert hall, and investigators searched for clues. One survivor recounting the terrifying moments gunfire erupted, people trying to run for safety, and then seeing bodies on the ground. 
It was clear they had no signs of life. We realized then that there would be no hostage taking. He said, we had to do something, to run away, because it was somebody coming to kill. Two of the suspects were seen in a video released by Russian authorities as police transferred them to investigators. But more than 80 people are still missing. Among them, Igor Pogodiev's wife. I ran among the ambulances, searched among the crews and asked questions, he said, but I couldn't find anyone. Islamic State quickly claimed responsibility for Friday night's attack, a claim American intelligence backed up. The group even released a video showing the gunmen filming themselves as they marauded through the Krokus City Hall, hunting victims and shooting them at point-blank range. But Russian officials, including President Vladimir Putin, have repeatedly implicated Ukraine. America's government fears Putin will exploit the attacks as a pretext to rally support for his war in Ukraine. Matt Bradley, NBC News. Well, the U.N. is mourning that more people in Gaza could die from starvation after Israel said it would no longer allow food convoys from the U.N.'s Palestinian Refugee Agency to enter the northern part of the enclave. UNRWA, as it's known, is the largest aid group operating in Gaza. The head of the agency made the announcement yesterday in a post on X. He called the decision, quote, outrageous and called on the restrictions to be lifted and said many more people will die of hunger and dehydration. The worsening humanitarian situation comes as the United Nations Security Council prepares to vote again on a new ceasefire proposal. Well, the U.N. Secretary General says pressure is growing on Israel to halt its assault on Gaza. I see a growing consensus emerging international community to tell the Israelis that the ceasefire is needed. And I also see a growing consensus. I heard it in the US. I heard it from the European Union, not to mention, of course, the Muslim world. A growing consensus to tell clearly to the Israelis that uh, any ground invasion of Rafa could mean a catastrophic humanitarian disaster. Joining us now is NBC News international correspondent Raf Sanchez, as well as Hagar Shamali. She's the host of Oh My World on YouTube and the former NSC director for Syria and Lebanon. Good morning to you both. Raf, I will begin with you. So walk us through this decision by Israel to halt UNRWA's food convoys from entering northern Gaza. Remind us what happened there and then tell us the reaction to this kind of move and the impact it could have. Savannah, good morning. Yeah, UNRWA says the last time it was able to deliver food to northern Gaza was January 29th, so nearly two months ago. It says since then it has applied multiple times to the Israelis, to the military, to get that food up to northern Gaza. It has been denied each time without being given specific reasons. And they say they found out on Sunday from Israel there is now a blanket ban on any UNRWA food deliveries to the north of Gaza, despite that warning that famine is now looming there. UNRWA is saying this is only going to lead to more deaths. As you said, they are calling this outrageous. And they say this is making what is already a man-made crisis much, much worse. Now, UNRWA has been in the sights of the Israeli government for decades. There is no love lost between these institutions. Israel accuses UNRWA of perpetuating the Palestinian refugee problem rather than trying to solve it. And they have accused UNRWA employees of actually taking part in the October 7th attacks, crossing over into Israel, kidnapping hostages themselves. The Israeli government today is saying UNRWA is, quote, tainted with terrorism and saying that it needs to be dissolved. So they are not at all trying to hide that they are blocking this agency from delivering food. What you will hear from other humanitarian organizations is whatever animosity there is between Israel and UNRWA, UNRWA is the only show in town in Gaza. It is the only organization with the scale, with the capacity to address this crisis. And that if you cut UNRWA out of the equation, it is only going to lead to an already dire situation especially in northern Gaza, getting worse. Mm. Guys. Hagar, let's bring you in here. The United Nations Security Council is expected to vote again today on another resolution that would call for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza for the remainder of Ramadan. Comes after the United States' own resolution was blocked. Will this one be any different? 
No, the United States is expected to veto the resolution today, which has been drafted by China and Russia. And the reason for that is that it does not at all mention the hostages. It doesn't ask for them to be released or demand that Hamas release them in exchange for this ceasefire. Um, and there's also another aspect to this, which is that the U.S., along with Egypt and Qatar, are continuing to mediate negotiations between Israel and Hamas on a six-week ceasefire. Uh, apparently, over the weekend, there had been some improvements made uh, or just, you you know, inches made closer on the agreement on how many of the 40 hostages that Hamas would release out of 130, how many of those 40 would be exchanged for Palestinian prisoners. Israel had agreed to the number, and now the, the, that, that proposal is in Hamas's lap, waiting for their response on it. And so the U.S. view is that if this resolution were to pass, it would undo all of that work, and Hamas would have no incentive to agree to that ceasefire. But either way, the U.S. will veto it. The problem with that is that it will only make the U.S. government look awful in this situation when they're actively trying to work on this other path. Mm. Raf, this is all happening alongside ongoing ceasefire talks, uh, as we've been discussing, part of this resolution, but also generally. We understand you do have an update for us there. What are you hearing? Yeah, Savannah, so the CIA director, Bill Burns, was in Qatar over the weekend. It's one of many, many trips he has made either to the Middle East or Europe to try to get these talks on track. As Agar was saying, it does sound like there has been some slight improvement over the weekend. I spoke to an Israeli official this morning. They say they are putting the chances of a deal in the near future at 50-50. Now, that is not super optimistic, but it is more positive than we were hearing from the Israelis the other week. They say at this point they are waiting for a formal Hamas response to a proposal that was hammered out with the help of the CIA director in Qatar over the weekend. I'll caution, we've been here many, many times before where the U.S., Israel, Egypt, and Qatar are able to agree something amongst themselves. They send it to Hamas. It's a non-starter, and we end up stuck as we've continued to be. Guys. And Hagar, you know, yesterday Vice President Kamala Harris appeared on ABC News and warned Israel against a ground offensive in Rafa. Let's hear more of what she said. Any major military operation in Rafa would be a huge mistake. Let me tell you something. I have studied the maps. There's nowhere for those folks to go. And we're looking at about a million and a half people in Rafa who are there because they were told to go there. Are you ruling out that there would be consequences from the United States? I am ruling out nothing. So, Hagar, if there were consequences from the U.S., what could those even be? Well, you have a few angles here. So from the U.S. side, when you have a situation like this where, where Israel may end up causing not just this humanitarian catastrophe, but one of the things Secretary Blinken was warning Netanyahu about was that this could have problems for decades to come and could create, could make this war a long insurgency, where you've basically driven these individuals, these, these civilians, into the arms of the enemy, and now they've, they're going to be taking up arms. The terrorists are the ones who are going to be welcoming them, causing a decades-long problem. And so what happens with that is that back in the U.S., you're not going to be able to have much control over how things are viewed on Capitol Hill, for example, when they appropriate foreign aid. They're likely to discuss, as are or they already are about making it conditional. That it's where it becomes tenuous. I don't think the friendship is going to go anywhere. But when you make that aid conditional and the U.S. is really the only friend standing left, it makes things very difficult for Israel's future. Hagar and Raf, thank you both very much. On the campaign trail, both President Biden and former President Trump are still on the path to a 2024 election rematch. They've already clinched their respective party nominations. And over the weekend, both nominees easily won the Louisiana primary elections. The president still waiting for the results of the Missouri primary, which should be released next week. NBC News senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen joins us now. So, John, uh, Louisiana, does it tell us anything that we don't already know? I would desperately love to tell you that uh, pouring over the results of Louisiana, looking at maps all weekend, uh, that I could tell you something <laughs> prophetic uh, that came out of those numbers. But the truth is, no, uh, Joe Biden easily won the Democratic primary. Donald Trump easily won the Republican primary uh, with no real competition on either side. Uh, there's not much that you can extrapolate there. It was not a heavy turnout election. There are probably uh, 300,000 or so people that voted between the two sides. Uh, there are about 2 million people that vote in general elections in Louisiana.
All right, John, I know you got something for us, maybe with swing voters, recent polling, giving us an in-depth look. Tell us uh, what we're seeing, but also remind us how critical some of these voters could be in this particular election, this rematch. Yeah, great question, Savannah. I mean, there were so many close uh, states in the last election and the last two elections, and really going back uh, to about 2000, we've had historically close elections in terms of electoral votes outside of maybe Barack Obama's re-election in I'm sorry, uh, first election in uh, 2008. So uh, swing voters are, are the um, the premium voters. Those are the ones that, the that particularly in swing states, uh, can really make the difference between who wins and loses the presidency. Um, you know, what we see from swing voters is uh, a lot of what we see is dissatisfaction with the two candidates. But, um, you know, right now, polling shows uh, broadly that Donald Trump is in the lead. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's part of that is swing voters having moved a little bit from where they were in 2000. John, while we have you, Wisconsin Congressman Mike Gallagher announced that he is resigning early. He's a Republican. He hasn't been afraid to criticize his own party. What impact could this have on Republicans in the House who have this narrow lead? Yeah, normally you would say uh, a congressman deciding that he was going to resign early instead of simply not seeking re-election, which is what he had said before, was not really a big deal. Uh, but the margins are so narrow in the House that when Gallagher leaves in April, uh, it will put the Republicans in a place where they can afford to lose only one vote on any uh, on any particular uh, measure that comes to the floor. Um, so if you're Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, uh, your, <laughs> your, uh, your margin for error just got cut in half. And as we've seen, it's very difficult for him to get anything done. Um, you know, as it stands. So uh, this is actually like much bigger news than it would normally be. Mm. All right, John, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Let's get you to weather now. The first weekend of spring felt like the height of winter for a lot of people across the country. Let's check on your morning news now weather with Michelle Grossman. Michelle, good morning. Good morning, guys. Yeah, we're seeing heavy snow in a lot of spots. Some spots saw more snow in this storm than they saw all winter long. So uh, we're looking at the northern plains, parts of the central plains, into the upper Midwest, looking at really heavy snow today. It's a big storm uh, extending all the way down to uh, the southern plains as well, the lower Mississippi Valley. On the warm side, we're looking at the chance of widespread rain. We're seeing that right now. We even seeing a couple of lightning strikes early this morning is later on today with that daytime heating where we're going to see the chance for some strong storms. That includes a chance of tornadoes. Back to the west, we have some snow falling in the Intermountain West. We have some snow and rain along the Pacific Northwest. We're looking at California, also Washington into Oregon, and the East Coast looking really good. It was so soggy over the weekend, especially Saturday, looking nice from New England all the way down to the southeast with lots of sunshine. So many people, millions under alerts this morning because that because of that storm system in the middle of the country. Twelve million under winter alerts. That's where you're seeing the white extending from the northern plains, the upper Midwest into the central plains. We have wind alerts for 67 million people. Could see some power outages as we go throughout this Monday. So it is a stormy Monday for many. Radar showing us how stormy it is. We see that blue. That is where the snow is falling. The lighter blue, the white color, that's where the heaviest snow is falling. Kind of sandwiched in the middle. You see a little purple there. That is sleet and also some freezing rain. And then on the warm side, we're looking at some really heavy rain. That's where you're seeing those darker colors. Here's that area of low pressure. It's a big storm in size, all stretching from the northern tier of the nation all the way to the southern tier of the nation. Intense snowfall, uh, one to two inches per hour. Could see some torrential rainfall as well. That could lead to some flooding, but we're also concerned about some strong tornadoes later on today. Tomorrow, we'll see that area of low pressure move off to the east. We'll see that snow slowly tapering off in the upper Midwest, coming to an end. And then we're looking at strong storms in the Ohio Valley and also the east central coast. Uh, Gulf Coast. And then by Wednesday, it's back to the umbrellas along the Gulf Coast. We're not looking or the East Coast. We're not looking at what we saw on Saturday, but still some wet weather, especially in parts of New England. You can see those brighter colors showing up. And then also parts of the Carolinas into the southeast. Widespread rainfall. It's excessive in some spots. That's going to lead to some flooding. And we're also looking at that severe weather threat as we go throughout the afternoon. Nine million people under the threat for severe storms, especially where you see the orange, Greenville, Jackson, Alexandria, Hattiesburg, looking at the chance for some really gusty winds, winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour, some hail, and also some strong tornadoes. We're going to watch this closely throughout the day. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate sure, thank it. Thank you. Sure. Coming up, new numbers show that home sales are surging after high mortgage rates slowed the market. So what's behind this new real estate revival? We're going to dig into the answer. Plus. Holy crap. That is not good. Ooh. Why is our tail on fire? That's not good, y'all. That's fire on the water. That's dramatic video showing smoke pouring out of part of a Carnival cruise ship. That wasn't the only scare at sea. What we've learned about a deadly incident involving two workers on a separate cruise. Stay with us. 
Welcome back. A passenger on a Carnival cruise ship caught this moment when flames broke out on the massive ship near the Bahamas over the weekend. This terrifying event comes as new details are emerging about another incident that left two crew members dead on a separate cruise ship. Here's NBC News correspondent Marissa Parra with the details. It's a relaxing cruise turning terrifying for passengers. Holy crap, that is not good. Keith Barnes filmed this video of flames billowing from the back of the Carnival Freedom cruise ship. What was going through your mind? I was shocked. I mean, I looked out there and I'm, you're not supposed to see black smoke and fire shooting out of the tail end of the cruise. The ship was just off the coast of the Bahamas when Carnival says the fire started in the exhaust funnel during severe weather. I'd say 2.30, 2.45. The loudest thunder, lightning clap that I have ever heard in my life happened. It scared us so bad. Carnival saying in a statement, while we continue to investigate multiple eyewitness reports of a lightning strike, inspection revealed the damage is more than we first thought and will require an immediate repair, adding there were no guests hurt. This, now the second time in two years, a Carnival Freedom funnel has caught on fire. This is, of course, a very serious and sensitive situation. No guests injured in that 2022 incident either. Meanwhile, Bahamian authorities are investigating a deadly incident aboard a Holland America cruise ship. The company says accidental steam release in an engineering space on board killed two crew members. I met a couple. They said that they saw a burst of steam erupt from the side of the ship. Lainey Doss was on board and says the mood immediately turned somber. People were crying. There was a moment of silence. When the captain announced what happened, his voice broke. He started crying, and that just was absolutely heartbreaking. Holland America says the ship was determined to be fully operable. The cause still under investigation. Marissa Parra, NBC News, Miami. International news now. Medical professors in South Korea are joining the country's doctor's strike, which has now been going on for more than a month. NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman joins us with the latest on that, as well as other world headlines. Hey, Josh, good morning. Hey, good morning, Savannah. That medical crisis in South Korea is now worsening as those med school professors join junior doctors and residents uh, in protesting and going on strike with many of those professors now submitting their resignations. They are protesting a government plan to increase med school admissions to help deal with exploding demands for health care from South Korea's aging population. But the current doctors fear it will lower quality and decrease physician salaries. Now let's head over to Senegal, where early Early election results show Basiru Diome Faye leading in the hotly contested presidential race, sending his supporters into the streets in celebration. Now, it's likely this race will go to a runoff, but this has been a major test for a democracy that has years of political unrest in the recent past, as well as being in a region that is prone to military coups. And finally, over to Paris, where the host of this summer's Olympic Games just hosted a very different competition. This one features cafe and restaurant waiters who jog, swerve, and dodge through more than a mile of Paris streets, carrying trays with coffee, a glass of water, and of course, a French croissant. The race had been on hold for more than a decade, but it has just been resurrected to celebrate France's cafe culture as they get ready for those Olympic Games this summer. Okay, that is <laughs> as impressive as yeah, an exactly. Olympic sport. That, right, it should be a sport. Yeah, These exactly. Are doling they, out the medals. Medals, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, Princess Kate undergoing treatment after her shocking cancer announcement. What we know about preventative chemotherapy as support pours in from around the world. We're back with the latest on the Princess of Wales health. On Friday, Kate Middleton revealed that she is being treated for cancer. The royal family and people all around the world are now rallying around her amid a lot of uncertainty over what comes next. NBC News international correspondent Molly Hunter has the latest. This morning, an outpouring of love and support for the Princess of Wales following her shocking announcement. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London. And at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. In Friday's deeply personal video message, the 42-year-old sharing she's in the early stages of preventative chemotherapy, which Kensington Palace has began in February. The palace adds Kate herself chose to write and deliver a video message instead of a written statement. I am well. I'm getting stronger every day. And the global reaction was immediate. 
President Biden posting, Jill and I join millions around the world in praying for your full recovery, Princess Kate. The British Prime Minister adding, the Princess of Wales has the love and support of the whole country. And Kate's brother, James Middleton, posting, over the years we have climbed many mountains together. As a family, we will climb this one with you too. From California, Prince Harry and Meghan wishing Kate health and healing and have reached out to the Wales family privately. Having William by my side is a great source of comfort and reassurance too, as is the love, support and kindness that has been shown by so many of you. Immediately following the announcement, King Charles also going through cancer treatment, saying he is so proud of his daughter-in-law. I think for for her and for the uh, and for the king, the, the outpouring of, of, of support for both of them and well wishes for the, both of them to to recover um, quickly has been um, has been hugely heartening. A source at Kensington Palace adds the pair had lunch on Friday before the video's release. This new experience for them both will really cement what has long been um, a very affectionate bond between the king and his beloved daughter-in-law. You know they share a lot of the same interests. And now, with the kids on Easter holiday, a plea to grant her family privacy while she recovers. As a family, we now need some time, space and privacy while I complete my treatment. For now, I must focus on making a full recovery. Our thanks to Molly Hunter for that report. Joining us now for more on this is Dr. Cedric McFadden. He is a certified surgeon and clinical associate professor of surgery. Dr. McFadden, thanks very much for being here. So. Uh, we should start, of course, by saying the royal family has not revealed what kind of cancer the princess is being treated for or how advanced it is. Um, but, but the little pieces of information we do have here, I guess the first question is, you know, we know that this came after what they called a planned but major abdominal surgery back in January. So what does that tell us about what they may have potentially found, the fact that that's the type of surgery it was? And then also explain this preventative chemotherapy to us that the princess mentioned she's undergoing. Yeah, so it's not uncommon to have what we call incidental findings of a uh, cancer after doing a procedure for one intended reason. Uh, this idea of preemptive chemotherapy, this is what we call adjuvant chemotherapy. This is a type of treatment that's given, it's anti-cancer medications that are given after the index procedure is performed to mop up or to clear away any residual cancer cells that may be too small to see with the eye or certainly left behind after any procedure is performed. It's routinely done for earlier staged cancers uh, or for cancers that may have the propensity to spread after. So it's medications that are given to reduce the risk that that cancer could come back or can come back in other locations. So it's not uncommon to have adjuvant chemotherapy. We do it often mm. for colorectal cancer, certainly for breast cancer as well. Dr. McFadden, you know, we're seeing a rise in younger adults being diagnosed yeah. with cancer, including people who are, who are seemingly healthy, like Princess Kate. Uh, how do you approach treating younger patients? Are there differences with how you treat younger versus older? Well, I think th there are several. Certainly, we have to make sure that any medications that we're given are appropriate for the type of cancer that they're dealing with, making sure if the cancer is more aggressive, that we're being aggressive with it. I think we also have to remember that regardless of the age, you know, this is something that for the rest of their life, we may be dealing with longer. So as opposed to someone who's diagnosed in their 60s or 70s, we may be following this particular cancer for years on down the line. So that's going to extend that uh, uh, surveillance. It also comes to um, importance that we take in consideration for individual treatment options that can have effects on IV production, if they desire to have more children, or their overall effect on raising children or having a family. If you're a young adult, you have different concerns than you do than if you're a 60 or 70 year old. And I think there's certainly the emotional and the you know, psychological support that's so necessary for anybody who's going through cancer uh, that we have to also be supportive of, especially as a young adult. Uh, doctor, for anybody at home who's just concerned hearing a lot of these headlines, seeing somebody, as Joe points out, like Princess Kate, who looks so healthy having this happen. We've talked a lot about the increase in colon cancer in young people. What should people keep in mind? What should they ask their doctor about? When has anything really become a concern? Well, I think what, what, what I've understood is that cancer will look very different for my children the way they view cancer as opposed to what I view cancer. You know, we see there are certain types of cancers that are on the rise that are not just happening in people that are in their 60s and 70s. It's happening in their 40s and 30s as well. Colorectal cancer, breast cancer, GI cancer as well. 
I think it's important to remind people what signs and symptoms are for cancers like colorectal cancer, rectal bleeding, change in bowel habits. And I think the really big thing is just bringing up concerns for their doctor, and you may be having conversations earlier than later about many of these medical conditions. So find a good doctor early on and start these conversations about your risk factors and symptoms mm. that you could be having. Really important information. Dr. Cedric McFadden, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Coming up, an attempted kidnapping caught on camera. The terrifying video and the quick thinking by the girl's mom that may have saved her life. Stay with us. We're back with the heart-stopping video of an attempted kidnapping in New York City. A ring camera captured the moment when a New York mom jumped into action after a man forcefully grabbed her daughter. NBC News correspondent George Solis has the story. <laughs> Terrifying moments all captured on camera. A teen entering her queen's apartment is ambushed by a masked man. Watch again. A man dressed in camo, jumping her from behind, forcefully grabbing the teen and dragging her away. The woman chasing after her is her mother, Adriana Alvarez. I never heard her scream like that. You weren't thinking about your safety at that point? No. No, absolutely not. No. No, it's my baby. Can't take her. Adriana followed as the man continued to drag her daughter away. The three kicking and fighting all the way down four flights of stairs. The harrowing ordeal unfolding this past January as her 18-year-old daughter Lex was coming back home after finishing a morning dog walk. He managed to grab my hair through the door. I remember being thrown onto the, the heater. The NYPD identified the suspect as 25-year-old George Vassilou, her daughter's former co-worker. He pled not guilty to a slew of charges related to the attack, his attorney not commenting. He's just pepper spraying me. He's punching me. The brawl reaching John Velez's first floor apartment. I heard her screaming. She ran to my apartment. I started chasing him. He, he ran across the street. Enter neighbor Gus Bugas, who ran after him. And I threw him on the floor. And once I got on top of him, he couldn't go nowhere. Alvarez says she suffered a dislocated shoulder and eye injury. Her daughter amazingly sustaining minor knee scrapes. Price of a mom putting herself in harm's way, but coming up a hero. I just had angels by my side. I'm just so grateful and so thankful just to have her back. George Solis, NBC News, New York. Well, that is just incredible. All right, let's get you some financial headlines now. The White House is feeling green with new plans to wave goodbye to carbon emissions. CNBC Savannah Hanau has that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Hey, Joe. Hey, Savannah. Good morning to you. Yes, yeah, so the White House announced a more than $6 billion effort to cut greenhouse gas emissions this morning. The funding, which largely comes from President Biden, uh, his Inflation Reduction Act, will go toward nearly three dozen projects in more than 20 states. It will help manufacturers electrify and decarbonize boilers, furnaces, and factories across the country. These companies make a range of things from steel and cement to processed foods. Meanwhile, Japanese automaker Nissan reportedly will add more than a dozen all-electric vehicles to its lineup by April 2026. The company said the 16 EV offerings will be a part of the 30 total new models it plans to start selling within the next three years. That's according to the Wall Street Journal. And the automaker also said it would explore new partnerships right here in the U.S. The plans come after Nissan cut its global sales forecast earlier this year as a result of logistics issues and steep competition. And there are two big, big lottery drawings coming up this week. The Mega Millions jackpot grew to more than $1 billion after no one won on Friday night. And the Powerball jackpot hit $800 million this weekend after no one guessed Saturday night's winning numbers. You can try your luck with the Powerball tonight. The next Mega Millions drawing will be on Tuesday night, guys. At some point, they're just going to have to change the name to Mega Billions, the way this is going. Uh, yeah, so, seriously, so right? It's happened a lot. Right. Are you going to get a ticket? Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I might get a Powerball one. Yeah, yeah cause, right? simply because I have a $4 winner that I can spend. Oh, so there you go. There you go. <laughs> Love it. All right, Savannah, good thank luck. you. Thank you. We've got good news for those looking to buy a home. The number of houses for sale is finally going up after nearly two years of limited inventory. NBC News correspondent David Noriega explains what's behind the trend and whether it's enough to get more people into homes. After many sluggish months, an unexpected surge in home sales. It was kind of a fresh breath of air for us in the real estate community and, and definitely caught us off guard.
Tom Hernandez is a realtor in Los Angeles. He says after two years of scarce listings, the market is finally loosening up. My production's probably almost doubled since the beginning of the year, both buyers and sellers. Sales of existing homes rising 9.5% nationwide in February, the largest month-to-month -month increase in a year. In the western U.S., home sales skyrocketing 16.4%. This comes even as home prices continue to rise, and mortgage rates, though lower than their peak last year, remain stubbornly high. Trying to see mortgage rates of 3%, 4% is out of the question. 5%, I think it's hard pressed to get there. But I think consumers are understanding that 6%, 7% are the new normal, and they're just looking for more choices. So what's behind the surprise heat in the market? For one thing, inventory is up. For a couple of years now, people have avoided putting their homes on the market because they wanted to hang on to their super low interest rates. But those rates have softened slightly and life happens. People need to move. So that's starting to change. Newly renovated kitchen. All the appliances stay. For home buyers, those who can brave the high prices, it's nice to have options. I'm looking for a property to purchase. So recently I see that there is more inventory in the market. The big question now is, is this a momentary surge, or will the spring bring even more of a thaw to the housing market? David Noriega, NBC News, Los Angeles. Coming up, we are flipping the script with Modi. Up next, I'm going to sit down with the comedian and comedy star to discuss how he made the transition from finance to comedy and so much more. Stay with us. Welcome back. Kevin Bacon is jumping back in time to cut loose Footloose, that is, one more time. Listen to this. 41 years after the cult classics release, Bacon announced that he's returning to the high school in Payson, Utah, where the film was shot. The student body sent the last several months actually campaigning for the actor to return for the last prom in the building before it relocates at the end of the year. So students stick to social media. They were doing the dance moves, flash mobs, even between classes. They also shared plans to host a charity event on prom day for Bacon's Foundation Six Degrees. Bacon responded that he was impressed with all their inspirational work, and now he's got to come. How cool is that? It was such a cool moment. I don't know if you saw, but when he told the school they were all there yes. early in the morning, amazing moment. It's so, so fun. Looking forward to that. All right, thanks, Savannah. Mm -hmm. Now to our series, Flipping the Script, featuring people on screen, on stage, and behind the scenes who are shining a spotlight on diversity. Enter stand-up comedian Modi. He was born in Tel Aviv and moved to the United States when his family, when he, with his family when he was seven years old. He started working in the financial industry right out of college, but switched to comedy after trying his hand at an open mic night. Now the Hollywood Reporter is calling him one of the top 10 comedians in New York City, and he is out with a new stand-up special called Know Your Audience, plus a national tour, and he is here on Morning News Now. Modi, good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here. So I talk here. about that. You start out as an investment banker, and then you, how do you make that switch from the banking world to the comedy world? It was 30 years ago. That was, uh, <laughs> I, was I was doing investment banking at, not far from where we are, and I used to come home and imitate the secretaries. My friends would be dying. I would just imitate all of the secretaries because okay. I was in an international office. There was all these accents and over-the-top characters. And my friends set it up and just do an open mic night and do all of this. And that's how it began. Was it instant? You just knew the moment you did it. You're like, oh, this is I, this Don't is forget, I came do. up there. I had nothing to lose. I didn't want to be a comedian. Yeah. I'm wearing a suit. I'm the only guy wearing a suit in the club. And I'm doing the stuff. <laughs> and I, I didn't care. But the owner of the club said you should keep with it and keep doing it. What did your mom think at first? Was she in on it or was she? I didn't tell her for many yeah. years. For a long time, <laughs> she didn't need to know about it. You were just it. quiet about the comedy. Then they started picking up. And then she found out. And then... Um, and then she wanted to come see to make sure I wasn't talking about her. And, uh, Were you? And he, no, I wasn't. I was doing these over-the-top characters, and uh, now I talk about her. Um, but um, we, it, it, and then it just, I was doing both banking and uh, comedy, and then I left it in, like, 99, and then, and then been doing comedy full-time since then. And now that you are talking about your mom, how does she feel about that? Oh, she loves it. She My does. mother right. loves me doing comedy. <laughs> when I have shows in New York City, she starts making lists. I call her, she becomes the new Schindler. She makes lists and lists and lists of people to bring to the shows. She loves it. So um, we should talk, you were born in Tel Aviv. Your family moved here when you were young, but you often go back to Israel to perform shows, and you were actually there just before October Seventh, how we often I remember after 9-11 asking this question, 
Are we allowed to laugh? Are we allowed to do comedy? How has comedy helped in the wake of what happened? We have to laugh. We have to do comedy. We were in Israel um, right when the war began, that Saturday. We had a flight to go to Paris to do four shows there. And um, the war broke out. I mean, we, we were the last flight out of Israel. Um, for, and then three days, the airspace was closed. And... Um, and we landed in Paris, and do we do shows or we don't do shows? But we obviously did, and it was important. And I'm doing it now, too. And people need, like, people who are constantly in the war, they need, like, an hour and a half to just decompress. And at the end of the show, I sing Hatikva, which is hope. It's the, the word is hope. Uh, and it's the Israeli national anthem. And people who are Jewish and not Jewish and and, and uh, anybody, everybody sings it together. If they know the words or, don't, or they don't know the words, it's just an amazing moment at the end of the show. And what is it you hear from people who are in those shows right now? They are, they're so happy. They're thankful. We haven't laughed. It's been so hard. We're following the war. It just takes you out of the war for an hour and a half. And put, and then, or, or following it, you know? Yeah. So it's so important to laugh. You are also an LGBTQ plus, part of the LGBTQ plus community. How has that played into your comedy? And, and... It's the best thing I ever have. I don't know. It's, uh, I, I'm, I'm married. My husband produced this, this special that we did with 800 Pound Gorilla. Do you talk about him? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I talk about him, and he's younger. It's more like a, me being married to a millennial rather than me in a gay marriage. Got it. And, yep, yep. Uh, and um, it's the best thing in the world, and, and he... He writes, uh, he helps me write jokes. He's hysterical and, uh, and proud to be gay and proud to be Jewish. And it's, it's an amazing thing. Well, that is absolutely incredible. Um, what's next for you? What is most important for you? Oh, my God, we've, we're still on tour. I'm yeah. still on tour. Uh, we are, it's called the Know Your Audience Tour. Mm -hmm. uh, even though it's the same name as the special, it's not uh, the exact same material. This is your first special, right? This is my first special. How does that feel? It feels like I just gave birth. <laughs> I feel like I just gave birth. The, the, from taping it to editing it to, to how you, when you release it and all that. And it's just, and it's landing at the right time, right when the world needs this exact material, this, this proud to be Jewish moment, this proud to be just happy moment. Um, the special is a portal into the Jewish world for everybody to see. That, that's what it is. Modi. Yeah. Modi, thank you for your time this morning. My Congratulations pleasure. on you. everything. The special is called Know Your Audience. It's streaming now. You can go to modilive.com to check that out. He's also performing live at the Kennedy Center yeah. on April 11th, it's which is an amazing Towards the end space. of the tour, yeah, that's the Kennedy there Center. I'm looking forward to that, Very too. Cool. Modi, and thank th you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Savannah? Amazing conversation. Finally, this hour, there are new plans to bring extinct animals, cue the Jurassic Park theme music, like the woolly mammoth, back to life. But not everyone in the science community is on board. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky takes a look. At Colossal Biosciences in Dallas, the mission is clear. Pair cutting-edge science with high-tech tools to reach a goal of prehistoric proportions. We are less than five years away from seeing mammoths back on the planet. Not if it's going to happen, when it's going it is, to happen. It is simply a function of time. So two really interesting Which is why co-founder and CEO uh, Ben Lamb says, now's the time to embrace the term de-extinction, the process of creating an extinct species, or at least an animal that resembles one. In Colossal's case, the woolly mammoth, which died off roughly 4,000 years ago. The company announced a major breakthrough, how to essentially reprogram the cells of elephants, allowing Colossal to then recreate their modern-day version of a mammoth. You'd be forgiven if all this sounds like... Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. We've heard the Jurassic Park comparison once or twice, right? Now we're not taking, you know, dino DNA and putting in frog DNA. We're not taking mammoth DNA and putting in elephant DNA. We're actually doing it in exactly reverse. Asian elephant DNA, to be exact, because according to Colossal, it's the closest living relative to its prehistoric predecessor, a 99.6% match. The return of the woolly mammoth essentially starts here. Yes, absolutely. We joined Dr. Ariona Hisoli, lead researcher on the Woolly Mammoth Project. So we're looking at essentially an Asian elephant in cellular form. That's actually correct, yes. Colossal says this process will allow them to not only bring back other extinct animals, but also save animals on the brink of extinction, and even improve the environment by restoring the animals to old habitats.
Even though Colossal admits that this is a major breakthrough, the company does stress, don't expect to see any real life woolly mammoths for at least the next few years. But in the science community, there are researchers who not only have questions here, but are concerned. Number one, it's not really a, a, a mammoth, it's a mutated Asian elephant. Dr. Vincent Lynch specializes in genetics and evolutionary biology at the University at Buffalo and stresses timing is everything. To put them back now isn't to replace something that was once there, but it's to put an invasive species into an environment in which it's never been before. Is there 1% in the back of your mind uh, of where something could go wrong? We're doing the best that we can to collaborate with all the top scientists, bioethicists, and conservationists around the world to ensure that it goes as right as possible, but there will always be some risk in any large moonshot for uh, society. A mammoth-sized moonshot coming soon. Morgan Chesky, NBC News, Dallas. Very cool. Huh. All right. <laughs> you seem, <laughs> you're, you're not sure. It's wild what is potentially <laughs> possible now, and uh, do we really need Maybe. to make it so? You could have a pet bully. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's well, do it for this hour morning news now. Stay with us, though. The news continues right now. Good morning, I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, it is deadline day for former President Trump. New York's Attorney General can now try to collect that more than $450 million bond from the civil fraud trial. But the question remains, can Mr. Trump come up with the money to actually pay for it? And what could happen if he can't? We're going to break down the stakes in just a moment. We're also watching some wild springtime weather that battered much of the Midwest and Northeast over the weekend, dropping even more snow. Farther south, a severe storm threat continues today with driving rains, hail, even tornadoes possible. We've got your full Monday morning forecast in just a moment. A somber split screen in Moscow over the weekend. The four men suspected of carrying out Friday's deadly mass shooting appearing in court. The city mourns the more than 130 people now dead. More on what we know about those suspects and the broader questions now swirling around Vladimir Putin's response to the tragedy. Plus, solar eclipse fever heating up. The tourism boom behind a cosmic spectacle of a lifetime that is now just two weeks away, two weeks from today. I know you're getting excited for the eclipse, right? I am getting excited for the eclipse. Actually, last week I got to have an amazing conversation with a community called Eclipse Chasers, people ah. who spend their life waiting for the next one, traveling the world. So I'll bring you that conversation. They're soon. very excited for yes. this one. All right, <laughs> we're going to begin this hour with the legal challenges surrounding former President Trump. That's right. Today is the deadline for Trump to pay a more than $450 million bond resulting from the New York civil fraud case judgment against him and his company. Trump says he's challenging the judgment and plans to take the case to the Supreme Court if necessary. Meanwhile, the former president is expected to be in a Manhattan courtroom this morning in his hush money payment case. We could find out today when that trial will get underway. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has the details. This morning, the former president is out of time. As soon as today, New York's attorney general may begin collecting more than $450 million from Donald Trump, the penalty for losing his civil trial for financial fraud. Rejected by some 30 different insurers, Mr. Trump now forced to cover the massive fine on his own as he tries to appeal the ruling from February, finding him liable for lying about his wealth to get better deals from lenders. No one's ever seen a bond th this size. Every single person when I came to them saying, hey, can I get a half billion dollar bond? Maria, they were laughing. The judge originally fined Mr. Trump $355 million, a figure that has continued to balloon with more than $100,000 in interest, racking up each day. We have a lot of cash and we have a great company, but they want to take it away. The former president's legal team asked an appeals court to intervene, but with no immediate relief, all of his assets, buildings, houses, even bank accounts are now potentially in play, a move the attorney general previewed last month. If he does not have funds uh, to pay off the judgment, uh, then we will seek, uh, you know, judgment enforcement mechanisms in court and we will ask the judge to seize his assets. While Mr. Trump tries to fend off a personal financial crisis, his criminal exposure has not faded. 
Facing charges of hiding a hush money payment to a porn star before the 2016 election, the presumptive GOP nominee had been set to begin a trial in that case in a Manhattan courtroom today. But it's been bogged down in delays. Mr. Trump back in court today as the judge mulls a defense team request for even more time. Our thanks to Laura Jarrett for that report. Well, the judge presiding over the hush money case last week rejected Trump's request to prevent his former lawyer, Michael Cohen, as well as Stormy Daniels, from testifying. Also this morning, the United Nations Security Council is expected to vote on a new resolution calling for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza days after a U.S.-sponsored resolution was blocked. The push for a ceasefire comes as the U.N. warns more people could die of starvation in Gaza following Israel's decision to ban food convoys from the UN's Palestinian Refugee Agency from entering the northern part of the enclave. NBC News International correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us on this from Tel Aviv. Raf, good morning. Let's start with this UN Security Council vote. What makes this ceasefire resolution different from previous ones, and what do we think about the support from the U.S. here? Savannah, good morning. So we don't at this point know whether the U.S. is going to support this resolution or whether it's going to use its veto at the U.N. Security Council to block it. Back on Friday, the American ambassador at the U.N. said that in its form then, the U.S. could not support this resolution. It said it potentially undermines the negotiations underway right now in Qatar, that it didn't explicitly link the ceasefire in Gaza to the release of hostages, that is something that we did see in the American resolution that was put forward on Friday and was then vetoed by both Russia and China. Now, there has been some diplomacy at the Security Council over the weekend. It's possible that this resolution has been tweaked in a way that the U.S. might be able to get behind it. But the early indications from the United States are that it is not planning to support it. If the U.S. does does veto, that would be the fourth time that it has vetoed a resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza, something that every time has left it looking isolated at the U.N. Guys. So, Raf, the push for a ceasefire is more urgent after the U.N.'s Palestinian aid agency, known as UNRWA, said that Israel has banned its food trucks from entering northern Gaza. What's going on here? Remind us some of the background and the potential impact now this could have moving forward. Yeah, Joe, so here's the deal. UNRWA says that the last time it was able, able to deliver food to northern Gaza was January 29th, nearly two months ago. It says since then it has applied to the Israelis several times for permission to go to the north, been blocked every single time, and that on Sunday the Israelis told them, blanket ban, you are not going to northern Gaza under any circumstances. Now, this has elicited a strong response from the Secretary General of the United Nations who's here in the Middle East. I want you to take a listen to that. The decision not to allow UNRWA's convoys to go to northern Gaza, where we have a dramatic starvation situation, is totally unacceptable. And those that took that decision must assume the responsibility facing history of the consequences of the decision in relation to the dramatic situation of the people in northern Gaza. So unusually blunt words there from the Secretary General of the United Nations basically saying people are going to die as a result of this Israeli decision. Now, UNRWA has been in Israel's sights for decades. It accuses it of perpetuating, not trying to solve the Palestinian refugee problem, and says that a number of UNRWA employees actually took part in the October 7th massacre, some of them crossing over into Israel, actually being directly involved in kidnapping Israeli hostages. UNRWA says it has fired everybody suspected of any involvement. But the Israelis are saying UNRWA is tainted by terrorism and saying that agency needs to be dissolved. Guys. Raf, we know ceasefire hostage talks are still continuing, and we understand you have some new details about where those are at right now. What are you hearing? 
Yeah, so an Israeli official telling me this morning they feel the chances of a deal in the near future about 50-50. That is obviously not super optimistic, but it is more optimistic than what we've been hearing from the Israelis in recent weeks. It does appear that there was some progress in Qatar over the weekend. CIA Director Bill Burns back in the region trying to jumpstart those talks. But at this point, no sign of an imminent breakthrough. Guys. All right, Rav Sanchez, thank you so much. Four men have been charged with terrorism and face life in prison in connection to one of the deadliest terror attacks in Russian history. More than 130 people were killed Friday during an ambush at a crowded concert hall in Moscow. ISIS has claimed responsibility for the attack, but Russian President Vladimir Putin is trying to tie Ukraine to the attack. NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley joins us with the latest. Matt, good morning. Good morning, guys. So Russians observed an official day of mourning yesterday, but this is a tragedy that's likely to have long-term political effects. Today, Moscow mourns. Russian President Vladimir Putin himself among the many lighting candles. After Russia endured its deadliest terror attack in 20 years on Friday, I honestly thought it was a firecracker, said this survivor, but these crackles, they were here. They, they weren't stopping. There was screaming, panic. At least 137 people were killed by four gunmen who marauded through this huge concert venue, shooting, throwing bombs, and burning the building almost completely to the ground. They were just walking and gunning down everyone methodically in silence, said this survivor. Sound was echoing, and we could not understand what was where. Emergency workers are still searching under the rubble and sifting for clues. Russian authorities say they've already nabbed the four perpetrators. The Tajikistan nationals appeared in court late yesterday, showing signs of injury. Islamic State Khorasan, or ISIS-K, an ISIS affiliate based in Afghanistan, quickly claimed responsibility for Friday night's attack, a claim America's National Security Council backed up. The same terror group whose suicide bombing at Kabul airport killed at least 170 Afghans and 13 U.S. servicemen during America's chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2021. Yet despite the evidence and the group's own claims, oh, Russian officials, including President Putin, are blaming a more familiar enemy, Ukraine, where Russians have been fighting for the past decade. Ukraine's president denied the accusation, and American leaders also blaming ISIS. For them, the attack raises a different concern, that Islamic State may be rising from the ashes in the Middle East. And guys, American officials are worried that Putin will exploit this tragedy to his own political ends, using it to rally support for his gridlocked war in Ukraine. Joe? All right, Matt, thank you. Rob D'Amico joins us now for more analysis on this. He's the founder of Sierra One Consulting and a former member of the FBI's hostage rescue team. Rob, thanks for joining us. So American officials say a branch of the terror group ISIS called ISIS-K is behind this attack. First of all, what should we know about this group? Well, ISIS-K was actually formed in about 2015. Actually, I was in Afghanistan uh, 2015 and 16 when they were just forming uh, from the group in Syria and Iraq. And it, it basically took a lot of small splinter groups that had bigger ambitions than the Taliban. The Taliban were a, a national, like, you know, running Afghanistan, but there's others out there wanting to form a caliphate and they were more violent and the more uh, stricter Shia law. So they started getting these groups together and they started fighting the, the Taliban and the U.S. Um, and it was, it was really odd to see because we'd be watching uh, the Taliban commanders uh, on predators, and then we had seen ISIS K attack, and they were so brutal. I remember at one point the the military commander we were watching ISIS K behead Taliban people, and and the, the commander just didn't know what to do to to shoot a missile in it to stop it or not. Um, but they are a violent group. They got a lot of uh, international fame from that attack in uh, August 2021. Up their funding, and I think about a year later they really started looking to attack outside that area. So we have learned that the National Security Council said the U.S. shared information with Russia earlier this month about a planned terrorist attack in Moscow. What do you make of that, and how do you think that information could potentially impact Putin's rule just days after he secured this fifth term? I think it goes to just humanity. Of, of We see an intelligence report that is talking about killing civilians. Even if you're you're not friendly with the country or not, you're still going to provide some heads up to them. Um, you see, this group has attacked Iran. 
They're now into Russia. They're 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 doing things in there that I really think are starting to hurt like uh, Putin's aura of this commander, you know, this author or authoritarian uh, dictator being in control. And he just got reelected with the highest number. And I think that hurt him. Not that we we don't mind seeing that, but we don't want to see civilians killed over that in the in the long term. Um, so a, a warning definitely probably went out uh, because we've been seeing some other warnings out there. You know, Putin didn't even mention ISIS when he addressed Russians about this attack. He's implied Ukraine was connected to it. Ukraine, of course, has denied the claims. America said ISIS was behind it. Are you worried he's trying to exploit this tragedy? Well, you know he's going to do that. But then again, you can't, you know, to look back into our own thing, like, you know, we blamed, uh, we, we started saying Iraq was uh, responsible for 9-11 as a reason to go in Iraq. And, and it, most people in the intelligence community knew that wasn't true. And it turned out to be not true. Um, but politicians don't don't consider that. They, they have objectives that they want to see. And sometimes they use information that way. He's definitely not going to do that. He'll probably never even come out and say that the U.S. tried to warn him. He's, he's always going to put this to back to Ukraine to use it because he sees that as a bigger threat than civilians getting killed. He wants to take that over. So if he can use this in order to leverage that, he's absolutely going to do it. Rob, this was the deadliest attack in Moscow in decades. What should we think about intelligence-wise, especially here in America, in terms of a focus after an attack as large as this? So uh, when I was briefing a bunch of uh, senators and congressmen in, in Afghanistan back in uh, 2018 when I was running FBI ops, I actually kind of said al-Qaeda, we knew ha how they planned. So when we started hearing intelligence, we kind of knew where they in the were in the process. And at the time, ISIS was uh, pushing individuals to do things, drive vehicles into groups, which we saw here. And it was a lot harder to to uh, thwart those uh, plans because it was just one person in their basement. Now that you're seeing bigger groups planning to do things like this, that's when you're getting into the communication systems of them. So I think uh, like General Carrillo made a comment uh, down, I think, last week to Congress uh, about something within six months with little to no uh, warning here in the U.S. We are seeing things. We are definitely seeing things. Europe saw some things. They thwarted some some uh, small level attacks uh, that were in the nascent stages. But I think uh, the U.S. intelligence community is worried about a, an attack back here probably within, you know, General Krillis said six months. I think they have some better understanding, but it's getting into that communication network. This attack will allow us to look and see what was out there about it to understand how they are communicating and help us better. All right, Rob D'Amico, thanks for your expertise. We appreciate it. Now to the severe weather impacting millions of people across the country. Another day of potentially dangerous conditions expected today with no sign of winter letting up into this last week of March. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch is in Minneapolis with the latest on the weather. Jesse, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. We woke up. It was raining. Then it turned to snow. Now it looks like it's back to a drizzle here in the Twin Cities. But this is not the only area dealing with this rough start to spring. This storm system causing headaches across much of the country. Overnight, steady snow and howling winds slamming the plains. With millions of Americans waking up this spring morning to a wintry snow globe. Feels good. <laughs> yeah, it does feel good outside. That Sunday storm system not only bringing snow to the Twin Cities, but also spawning at least four reported tornadoes, according to the National Weather Service. Kansas and Texas hit at the tail end of a brutal weather weekend. Parts of New York State and New England were blanketed in over two feet of snow. I was hoping that this was over for the season. As high winds hit New York City Saturday, this uprooted tree toppled over on a car. And Philadelphia was slammed by more than three inches of rain on Saturday alone. In nearby Chester, Pennsylvania, authorities say a six-year-old girl disappeared after slipping on mud and falling into a creek's fast-moving waters. Rescue efforts ended yesterday. On the other side of the country, first responders made this daring rescue Sunday in the fast-moving Los Angeles River. Our station, KNBC, capturing the dramatic moments on camera. Meanwhile, to the south, severe weather threats continue today. Multiple states bracing for the possibility of hail, flash flooding, and tornadoes through tomorrow. While back in the Twin Cities... Let's enjoy this while we got it and make some snowballs, and, you know? 
That's going to be tricky because we've got slush on the ground now. There is more wet snow in the forecast for tomorrow here in Minneapolis, but the bigger concern is the possibility of the standing water, the puddles turning into ice. And I know when we look at it, this mess, Joe, when we've talked to people on the streets here, this is spring in the Twin Cities, and I know you are no stranger to the weather yeah. around these parts either. Usually this time of year, tennis season started, and we knew we'd have to shovel the courts, and then we could oh play. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> or just play indoors. Yeah, what, did you put, what were you wearing? Just, just shovel snow? Yeah, you just shovel the snow, and then or just go inside. Felt different. It's fine. <laughs> then there the San Diego it. girl. <laughs> Jesse, thank you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. And now let's get that forecast with a check on your morning news. Now weather. NBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman is shoveling too right now. <laughs> that's right. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. I'm just picturing you out there on those courts <laughs> with like your tennis socks on. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but yeah, we're looking at a lot of snow in some spots, up to a foot in the northeastern corner of uh, Minnesota. So the snow is going to extend all the way from the northern plains, the upper Midwest, down through the central plains. That's where you're seeing this blue and white here. On the warm side, we're looking at the chance for widespread rain, heavy rain, excessive rainfall in some spots, with some heavy downpours, and also the chance of some storms. We could see uh, gusty winds winds, damaging winds, some hail. That's not the biggest threat. The biggest threat would probably be the chance for some tornadoes, and some could be on the strong side. So that's through the middle of the country. That's where most of the weather is happening today. We do have some snow in the inner mountain west, and then in the Pacific Northwest, we're looking to make sure rain and snow, mainly rain along the coast of Washington, also Oregon. Here's the good news. We had a really soggy day on Saturday in portions of the Northeast. That is cleared out. We had sunshine yesterday. Looking at sunshine today from New England all the way down to the southeast. Temperatures not bad either, right around uh, normal for this time of year. Where the temperatures are not normal on Wednesday, we're looking at the northern plains well below average for this time of year. I'll show you those temperatures in just a bit. Still looking at coastal rain along the west coast, and that's extending down to portions of northern California as well. And you could see with those brighter colors, we're anticipating some heavier rain. And then the rain, unfortunately, returns on winds to, to portions of the east coast from New England all the way down to the southeast. Looks like the Carolinas portions the southeast could see some heavier rainfall. Now, as we near Friday, still some lingering showers, some snow in parts of New England. The northern tier of the nation seeing more snow as well as the inner mountain west. And it looks like the west is still uh, wet with another storm system moving on shore. The middle of the country, the southern plains looking good, sunny and warm with temperatures in the 70s and also the 80s. This is the storm we're talking about. It's a big one in terms of size, also really impactful. We're looking at strong conditions, lots of impacts with that snow falling. Where you see the blue, that is the snow. You see some white, too. That's the heaviest snow falling. So the lighter blue, the white colors. And then we do have some rain falling, and it is heavy in portions of the Tennessee Valley into the Mississippi Valley. That's going to be the story as we go throughout the day. Even seeing a little lightning strikes, and that's going to pick up as we go throughout the afternoon hours. Millions under alerts. We're looking at 12 million under winter alerts. That is in the white, extending from the northern plains. The upper Midwest into portions of the Rockies and the central plains. Wind alerts in the blue, 67 million people uh, could see some damaging winds, bring some power outages. So we're going to continue to track the storm with the intense snow and wind across the northern plains, the upper Midwest, and then that torrential rainfall in the uh, south, along with that severe weather risk. This moves off to the east tomorrow, and then by Wednesday, we'll see that rain moving into portions of the east once again. All right, get the umbrellas ready. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Michelle. Sure. We've got much more to come on this Monday edition of Morning News Now, including my conversation with a woman behind many, many popular brands that have become household names over the years. Now, she's setting her eyes on Tupperware. She's a woman who truly means business. Looking forward to that conversation. First, after the break, the messages of love and support pouring in across social media for Princess Kate after she revealed she's undergoing treatment for cancer. We've got the latest on that next. We're back now with a closer look at the road ahead for Princess Kate and her family after revealing she has cancer and started chemotherapy. NBC's Kelly Cobier joins us now from Buckingham Palace with more. The Princess of Wales, 42 years old and now in treatment for cancer, telling the world in an emotional statement. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family. The cancer discovered after abdominal surgery in January. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. The palace won't reveal the type or stage of cancer or how long the treatment will last, saying the princess has a right to medical privacy. In most cases, preventative or adjuvant chemotherapy lasts three to six months. Kensington Palace says Kate started her treatment in late February. It has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be okay. 
Many hoping that by bravely opening up, the princess could raise awareness and help others. The Princess of Wales' brave decision to publicly talk about her cancer diagnosis will no doubt have an incredible effect all around the world, not only for people who are suffering from cancer, but for those who may be not recognising the signs and symptoms of cancer. And I think this is going to be her enduring legacy throughout her life. As cancer patients are being increasingly diagnosed at a younger age. One of the things that we have been most concerned about is this rise in cancers uh, that we would not normally expect to occur in someone, especially under the age of 50. Experts stress early detection is key. The Princess of Wales sending a message to her fans around the world and those who may be facing their own cancer battles. For everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, Please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. And the Princess of Wales won't be working for the time being while she undergoes her treatment. She won't return to her public duties until her medical team gives her the OK. Meantime, Kensington Palace says Princess Kate is in good spirits and focused on a full recovery. Savannah, Joe. All right, Kelly, thank you so much. Let's stay in the UK. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is set to announce new plans to invest millions in the country's nuclear deterrent. NBC's Josh Letterman has that and other world news. Josh, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. The UK is doubling down on nuclear with Prime Minister Rishi Sunak saying the UK will spend $250 million to expand its nuclear workforce. Sunak says that will be needed uh, to ensure that the UK can build new nuclear submarines and expand nuclear energy. The government here hopes it will support some 40,000 jobs and strengthen the nuclear deterrent. Now over to Brazil, where police have arrested two men for the assassination of a popular and outspoken councilwoman in Rio de Janeiro six years ago. 38-year-old Marielle Franco was the only black woman on the council and was killed in a drive-by shooting that garnered global headlines. Investigators say the two men accused of ordering her killing were connected with organized criminal groups. And finally, to Ireland, which is set to have its youngest prime minister in its history. Higher Education Minister Simon Harris, who is 37, won the election essentially by default after no other candidates jumped into the race. The vote came after the former Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar, unexpectedly announced his resignation last week, citing personal and political reasons. Guys, back to you. All right, Josh, thank you so much. Coming up, chaos on Capitol Hill this morning. Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene has now filed a motion to remove House Speaker Mike Johnson. We've got more on that and the GOP resignations that are threatening the party's razor thin majority in the House. That's next. Stay with us. Welcome back. Republican Speaker Mike Johnson is facing more pressure from his own party this week. The GOP's slim majority growing even slimmer with early resignations from House Republicans. Johnson supported that $1.2 trillion funding package, which was signed into law by President Biden Saturday. It followed several failed attempts by Republican lawmakers to vote on a series of amendments to the bill. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles joins us now from Washington with the latest. So Ryan, let's start with that funding bill. The government shutdown was averted, but the package does not include funding for Israel, for Ukraine. Republicans say they're still working on that. So tell us what was in the bill, what we saw in Congress this weekend. Well, it was a massive package, uh, Joe, $1.2 trillion. It was over 1,000 pages. It's going to fund the government through September, and it funds some major programs. Of course, the State Department, uh, it uh, funds the Department of Homeland Security and the Pentagon. There actually was a little bit of funding for Israel in there, which has some uh, progressive uh, members uh, of Congress angry, uh, but it largely ignores the major supplemental funding package uh, that the White House is pushing for that would uh, provide direct aid to Ukraine and Israel in their ongoing conflicts. And so uh, while members of Congress uh, worked right up until the last minute, in fact, even went past the deadline a little bit uh, to get this uh, package over the finish line, uh, it still leaves a lot of unfinished business here in Washington. And they're now on a two-week break before they can address a lot of these big, big issues that still need to be dealt with. After the vote, Georgia Republican Marjorie Taylor Greene introduced a motion to oust Mike Johnson from his role as House Speaker. What more can you tell us about that and what might happen here? 
Savannah, I'm really skeptical that this is really going to have any kind of serious momentum. I mean, when you talk uh, to rank and file Republicans, there's a lot of angst and anxiety over everything that they went through uh, in the fall when they removed Kevin McCarthy as speaker. There's no a real alternative to Mike Johnson right now to become the next speaker of the House. Uh, and with all that being said, though, there is a lot of uh, you know concern among conservative Republicans that Mike Johnson relied too much on House Democrats to get this spending bill passed. And they're also really concerned about the idea of him putting Ukraine funding on the floor, even though that probably has uh, overwhelming support from both Republicans and Democrats, uh, that a very relatively small section of conservative Republicans are very much opposed to Ukraine funding. Uh, so while I don't think that this has uh, kind of the oomph that it needs to actually become a reality, uh, anything could happen here over the next couple of weeks. And by Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, you know, writing something down, uh, submitting it for the record, that leaves open the possibility. It's basically a cloud that's hanging over Mike Johnson's head over every decision he's going to make here over the next couple of weeks. Ryan, here's another cloud. Wisconsin Representative Mike Gallagher announcing he's going to resign next month. This comes after Colorado Congressman Ken Buck served his last day in the House. How does this impact this razor-thin majority House Republicans have? Well, Joe, that's the reason that Mike Johnson has found himself in such a difficult position. In order to get anything accomplished with a razor-thin majority of what will amount to only one member in the next couple of weeks, he has to work with Democrats. But the very thing that conservative House Republicans don't want him to do is to work with Democrats. And so, uh, you know, that puts him in a position here over the next couple of weeks where he's got to try and find a way through uh, uh, trying to get some of this big stuff done without angering that conservative flank. What it could lead to, Joe, is that if that motion to vacate is put into place, if conservative Republicans attempt to try and boot him as speaker, that it may be Democrats that come to the rescue because they too do not want to go through all the drama of trying to find another speaker of the House. I couple talked to a couple of House Democrats uh, as they were leaving on Friday who left open the possibility that they would work to save Mike Johnson if he's willing to legislate. Uh, so uh, that could be an interesting twist to all of this, that it may be Democrats that ultimately could be his salvation wow. here over the next couple of weeks. All right. That was not on the bingo card this no. year. All right, Ryan, <laughs> exactly. thank you so much. Thanks. Let's turn now to the rise in squatters across the country. This is more people refusing to leave homes they have no right to be in, with some encounters even becoming violent. NBC's Valerie Castro has more. No, 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 no. Do not touch me. No, 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 no. Do not touch me. They're the house guests, no one invited. You're trespassing, and you're harassing me. Squatters making themselves right at home. Out of my house. It's not your house. It's not They're people who take over mostly vacant properties that aren't theirs. One New York case even turning deadly. Police now believe the 52-year-old Vitel was killed by squatters. It's terrifying. Patty Peoples says she discovered two women and kids in a Florida property she was preparing to sell and filmed her intense confrontations with them. I had squatters. They did $40,000 worth of damage, stole appliances. Bye. At one point, even threatening her with a tire iron. So you must want me to take this and break your phone. She says it took more than a month to get them out. How did you feel? It is, quite frankly, one of the most frustrating, unfair experiences and frightening experiences of my life. The burden of proof was on me, not the renters. It's unfair. Oh, my God. Unfair because squatters take advantage of laws meant to protect renters, oh often leaving God. homeowners helpless. You shouldn't be trying to steal my house. This video captured by New York's Eyewitness News has gone viral. A homeowner trying to force squatters out is then handcuffed by police and removed from her own home. No charges were filed. New York attorney Ann Margaret Carroza says squatting cases are on the rise due to more vacant properties and the high cost of housing. How are they getting away with this? If they pull out a fake lease or they pull out a fake deed, now it's a he said, she said. Don't empower them. Flash Shelton, who advises homeowners on how to push out squatters, says to protect your home, set up security cameras. Your best protection is basically being able to document when someone comes in. And call police as soon as you find someone. Please support this bill. Back in Florida, Patty is paving the way for change, advocating for new laws to fight squatting. What do you want to say to the squatters around the country? The gig is up. My hope is that within another year, squatting will be a pandemic that is on the decline. I 
own this no. house. Hoping her story empowers others to squash out the squatters. Oh God. Valerie Castro, NBC News. Coming up, the latest installment in our ongoing original series, Women Mean Business. That's right. After the break, my one-on-one -on -one conversation with the woman behind many of the popular brands you've come to know and love. Now she's looking to get the Tupperware party started. We'll bring you that up next. Welcome back. The anticipation and excitement are building ahead of next month's total solar eclipse. It's happening two weeks from today on April 8th. Sky gazers in more than a dozen states will have the chance to see the moon almost completely cover the sun for several minutes along what's called the path of totality. Remember that term from a few years ago? NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joins us from Dallas. He's in the path of totality. Morgan, good morning. Joe, greetings from the path of totality. Fun to say, right? Everyone has April 8th circled on their calendars. The countdown is upon us. Dallas is going to be one of those cities that's going to experience total darkness whenever that perfect alignment happens. But NASA says 31 million Americans already live uh, in that perfect zone. Of course, millions more expected to drive or fly in. So they have that perfect view and they look skyward and see what's expected to be a once in a lifetime event. With just two weeks to go, this morning eclipse fever is heating up. This is going to be the most insane solar eclipse. Come April 8th, the path of totality will span a massive 115 miles wide, running across 15 states from Texas all the way up to Maine. And there's already a mad scramble to prepare for the cosmic spectacle of a lifetime. Giant festivals and watch parties are planned at parks, museums, and businesses all over the country especially in places like Kerrville, Texas, which could potentially swell by nearly 10 times its population. We have everything from T-shirts, souvenir T-shirts. We have these uh, stadium cups. If you only get one thing for the eclipse, yeah. make it a moon pie and some glasses. Moon pie and some glasses, <laughs> yep. Some schools along the path have already canceled in-person learning on April 8th. In Erie County, Pennsylvania, all but one of the public school districts will be closed. And some employers are also giving workers a bit of a break so they can gaze up at the sky. The grocery chain Wegmans has announced some of its stores along the path of totality, like the ones in Rochester, New York, will be closed from 3 to 3.30 p.m. Writing, the opportunity to experience a total solar eclipse comes once in a lifetime, and we don't want our employees to miss out. And when it comes to those ever so crucial eclipse glasses, experts say do some research before you buy. I do not recommend that you just go on Amazon and type in eclipse glasses because there are many counterfeits out there. If you have glasses from a reputable supplier that have that ISO standard on them, they are good. If you're planning on flying to a location in the path of totality, you'll definitely have some company. Sites like Hopper have seen a surge of bookings. But rest assured, there are still a few deals left. The best deals are going to be in Jackson, Missouri. Airfare into Nashville is the lowest among all of the destination cities. Hotel prices will be under $100 if you book them now. Yeah, I got to act fast and take a good look at this ISO logo. This is what you want to see on your Eclipse glasses to make sure that you are safe when you put them on and look up. You'll be able to witness all of the cosmic grandeur, I can assure you. However, Joe, I got to tell you, I absolutely do not recommend you wear these while driving. That is not <laughs> recommended. What is recommended, though, I'm told, is pairing your glasses and experience with the moon pies. Yeah. It just makes sense, That's right? Got to go with it, you know? You're sending those to us, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, text me your address. We'll make it happen, man. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Morgan. Appreciate it. We have breaking news this morning. Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun will step down at the end of this year. The move is part of a broad management shakeup at the embattled aerospace giant. In addition to Calhoun, chairman of the board Larry Kellner will step down in May and president and CEO of Boeing Commercial Airplanes Stan Deal will leave his position effective immediately. The departures come amid calls for change after a host of quality and manufacturing issues on Boeing planes, including a mid-air incident where a door plug blew off a Boeing 737 MAX 9 Alaska Airlines flight minutes after takeoff. We're keeping our eyes on the sky this morning as United Airlines faces a new wave of scrutiny from the FAA. Savannah Hanau joins us with that and other money news. Savannah, good morning.
Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Good morning. Yes. Yeah, so the FA, the uh, Federal uh, Avi uh, Aviation Administration warned of potential delays to future United Airlines projects over the weekend, and it came after the agency announced that it would formally evaluate the Chicago-based airline following a series of safety incidents that includes a plane that rolled onto the grass in Houston and another that flew out of San Francisco with a missing external panel. According to Bloomberg, the delays could stem from the FAA not allowing customers on United's new planes or new routes. Chick-fil-A is walking back its commitment to using antibiotic-free chicken. The fast food chain says it will stop honoring the decade-old pledge this spring. Chick-fil-A said in a statement the change is intended to maintain a supply of high-quality chicken and the antibiotics it will allow are not important to human health. The U.S. and other countries have started to restrict the use of antibiotics in livestock as evidence emerged showing it was contributing to drug resistance and reducing the effectiveness of antibiotics used in humans. And the weekend box office seemed to be fueled by nostalgia. According to studio estimates, the new Ghostbusters movie, Frozen Empire, came out on top with $45.2 million in ticket sales. That's about even with the $44 million launch of its predecessor, Ghostbusters Afterlife, which came out in 2021. The weekend success handed Sony Pictures its first number one film since last summer, guys. Very cool. All right, Savannah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Well, now to the latest edition of our series, Women Mean Business. We are very excited to have our next guest here with us today. Lori Ann Goldman was the driving force behind many successful brands that have become household names like Coca-Cola, Avon, North America, and Spanx. Now, in her latest role as president and CEO of Tupperware Brands, <laughs> she's helping to revive the iconic company that created job opportunities for women across the country. It's an iconic brand and a staple of American kitchens. For nearly 80 years, Tupperware has kept our food fresh, while Tupperware parties in the 1950s and 60s became a cultural phenomenon, which helped bring women into the workforce. The company has had a tougher time in recent years, but now has a new leader in Lori Ann Goldman. She's just months into her role as Tupperware CEO, but Goldman brings 30 years experience in business at instantly recognizable companies. For 10 years, she held senior leadership roles at the Coca-Cola company before becoming the first CEO at Spanx, which she helped expand from a shapewear startup to a billion dollar brand, even getting the product on the runway at New York Fashion Week. From there, she moved to CEO positions at Avon and Of Me Aesthetics. Now, though, she's getting the Tupperware party started. Lori Ann Goldman is a woman who means business. And we are lucky that Lori Ann Goldman <laughs> is here in studio with us this morning. Yes. Lori, good morning. Thank you so good much. Good morning. We so appreciate you being here, Lori Ann. As I mentioned to you, a big Tupperware family. My Love aunt that. was the top performer in North America for really? a lot of my childhood. So I was so excited <laughs> to get to talk to you and so excited to hear oh, what awesome. you're going to do with this iconic brand. Let's start with the fact that, I, as our viewers just heard in, in that piece there, you have held some serious roles at some <laughs> big companies that we are all very aware of. Spanx, Coca-Cola, all these yeah. different places. And I understand that one of the big things that you see as a thread here is female leadership, female empowerment. Yes. Tell me about that. Absolutely. You know, I uh, when you, you think about like companies like Avon and Spanx and, and Tupperware now, you know, it's really about entrepreneurship and, mm. you know, how do you be the best you? How do you, you know, go beyond your, your comfort zone? And I just feel like I'm a perfect leader for, you know, all the, the women at Tupperware that create this like chain of confidence mm. and help each other from one step to the next and to take risks and be the best they can be. Mm. I want to ask you about that chain of confidence <laughs> in just a minute. First, so let's start with, with this role, with, with the fact that you are now in this position. So yes. first, it's my understanding, and I just got to be honest, this kind of surprised me. I understand you're only the second female CEO in the 78-year history fair. of this company, yeah. which is just really interesting because I think so many people associate Tupperware as this thing that gave women financial freedom, and yes. yet it hasn't been led by a woman very right. often. What do you make yeah. of that? Well, I think, you know, people pick leaders that they think are good fits for the company. And, you know, I have always had serendipity in my life as CEOs. You know, I wasn't recruited. Things would just kind of move along and um, I, you know, as a true believer CEO, just feel like the connection with this particular company and mm. the, the women is just a perfect fit for me. 
And it's you've been open and speaking with us in the lead up to this conversation yeah. about, you know, the company has faced some tough times. And that's part of the reason that you're here yeah. it is to try to turn that around. And I understand that you really see that as this potentially career defining opportunity, <laughs> even though, you know, it's it's not necessarily not risky. Yeah. What do you think and how do you plan to do that to yeah. make this change? Well, first of all, taking risks is just part of you know, part of the life and certainly part of, you know, a CEO's life. Um, I always feel like I'm in a pressure cooker. It's probably why my favorite product is the, the Tupperware pressure cooker. Um, <laughs> but I think in this particular case, you, you have this iconic brand mm. that, you know, you mentioned the 78 years, you know, it started for food conservation, for female empowerment. And that is like as relevant today as it was then. Um, you know, I think plans for taking the the company to continue to to grow is really kind of matching the you know that the brand with the consumers today and what they're mm -hmm. looking for. Um, we've been a direct selling company, and um, the landscape has changed, and we're looking to like love on our sellers, but also to make sure that we're in places that it's easy to get our products. And so I know like when there were the Tupperware parties, that, that chain of confidence, right, is, is women selling to other women in their homes. But what does that now look like? And how impactful do you think it can be for a woman who is looking for a way to make extra income? Yeah. Well, you know, we say that the people join Tupperware and they take it certainly as a business opportunity, but it's really also for engagement and community. Mm -hmm. And you hear the stories of our business leaders and that community is really really what draws them to, you know, to Tupperware. Um, the parties are still going on. We get the party started. And <laughs> I think, you know, after the pandemic, people were lonelier than mm. ever. And so kind of coming together for that personal interaction is still very you know, pre present and, and okay. real. Um, but we also do things on social and virtually and, you know, people sell all kinds of ways. A lot of um, influencing affiliate. Um, it's it's really great to see how creative our, our sellers are, and you know, finding women that love our products. Absolutely. Do you have like a one sentence? We only have a few seconds left, but piece of advice for people who are women in business. Yeah, probably I would say never say I can't. Mm. You know, because if you say I can't, what you're really saying is, you know, mm. I won't try. I won't risk it. I won't even consider it. And when you say I can't, it you know, keeps you from putting yourself that. in that uncomfortable position that's going to help you grow. I love it. Lorianne Goldman, thank you so much. <laughs> and congratulations on the position. We appreciate you coming to the studio. <laughs> I love it, Savannah. It was fun. So great to meet you. Thank you so much. All right, some great advice there. We've been talking about next month's solar eclipse, but an even rarer event is brewing farther out in space. 3,000 light years from Earth, a white dwarf star is on the verge of a once-in-a-lifetime explosion known as a nova. This is caused by a neighboring red giant star putting pressure on the white dwarf. The eruption is expected at any time before September. You won't even need a telescope to see it, as the fireball will be so bright it will look like a new star in the sky. For those who know their stars, it'll be happening in the Corona Borealis constellation. But that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stay with us, though. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.